Hey there, welcome to Let's Coffee. My name is K.O. Kosha and I'm joined today by Steve Benitez and you are the CEO. I'm the CEO. And founder of Bose Coffee. Um, Let's Coffee is a, well, it's basically a talk show where uh, if you've ever had those moments when you're having coffee, especially for those of us in the industry, and we're talking about coffee and the industry, and you think, oh, maybe we should have recorded this conversation. It would be nice if other people could get involved. Um, and that's really it. Just mm -hmm. the things that we talk about over a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are big ideas, right? Which is kind of interesting. These big ideas over a small cup I, of I like coffee. The, I like the idea. I like the concept. Uh, thank you very much, Ketio, for having me here. Thank you for thank you for joining us. Like it, it means a lot to me. You know, like I've been going to Bose for decades now, right? It's been 23. 23 years, years. 23 years of Bose. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember in the 90s when I first started drinking coffees, mm -hmm. um, it was very much, you know, Starbucks, Figaro, and Bose, mm -hmm. right? And everyone was saying, oh, Bose, that's a Cebu one. You got to try that one, mm -hmm. right? Um, so uh, like my, my very earliest memories of drinking coffee, mm -hmm. very much associated with, with your company. So it, it's, uh, it's an honor. What's the origin story for you? Or, you know, if it was like a comic book, right? What, how did, you know, what was the radioactive spider that bit Steve Benitez and turned you, you know, made you do Bose coffee? Uh, well, Bose was born out of my trips abroad. Okay. So I would really go out of travel in different places. And most of the time I find myself in coffee shops. Uh, I'm not a typical tourist who would go into very touristy areas. And so I'll go into local uh, areas that that's not frequented by tourists. And, and the most uh, convenient place to end up hanging out was a coffee shop. And so I really like, I really enjoyed the experience. I, you know, um, I started liking coffee as a beverage at first, but then it, it turned out to the whole coffee experience. Mm -hmm. And every trip I go out, I look forward to that whole coffee shop experience. That's because that's where I uh, have a very deep, a, a deeper experience of the culture of that particular place. Uh, I'll see the people around the coffee shops. I, I, uh, I just watch people walking around. I watch people interacting with each other because most of the time I would be traveling by myself, hmm. and it's a most comfortable place to be alone, right? Why was that? Why were you going places on your own? Was it for business? No, um, I, I'm, I'm a, by heart, I'm an adventurer. I really like to go and adventure different places. Way before all of this millennial experience, experiential stuff really happened, right? So, so for, for the record, you do not consider yourself to be a millennial. Millennial by heart, perhaps, okay. yeah. But uh, in an ex-gen body. <laughs> okay. Yeah so, uh, yeah, so that's something I really look forward to. I would spend more on experiences than actual, what they call... Uh, shopping or dining mm -hmm. out so and I I kind of have a very good uh, um, uh, dose of experience in a coffee shop and that's something I look forward to every time I traveled and one day I just said you know you, you asked me what what was the spider uh, that bit me that was when I uh, if I really think about it that was when I was sitting in a cafe outside in in, in Orange County in LA, uh, Orange County in LA, and I was on my way home that evening, and I said, I'm going to miss this experience. And then my friend said, I was with a friend of mine, and he said, Why don't we, I mean, you know, why don't we, why don't you just bring this back home? Mm -hmm. And I said, Why not? Right? So what, that was like. What was that cafe, do you remember? You know, I would go to that cafe, it was called Piray. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was in the mall, but it was, it was, it was outside the mall, the perimeter, and they had sidewalk uh, 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 ambiance and an alfresco area where you, I would sit down, look at the street, all the cars passing by, all people walking through the coffee shop. And that's when I said, why not? I mean, you know, why do I have to wait for my next trip? Why don't I share this experience that I really enjoyed to the community back home in Cebu? So... That was in 1994, wow. and uh, for two years, I studied the whole experience. Uh, I would travel more, go out of the country more, to just really study the whole experience. And at the same time, 
I dug deeper into the beverage itself. So uh, <clears throat> I attended I attended expos, I attended conferences, I did a lot of self study, I did a lot of uh, um, uh, how would I call this? Uh, really living the culture in my trips abroad. Right? So th that that's the whole that was the whole story behind my romance with the good coffee. So that means that your foundation year was 1996? 94, I started, that was the time I had that light bulb moment. Yeah. And 96 in June was the day that I opened my first shop. So that puts you at 23 years. 20, well, 94, I would be 25 years in, in my uh, exploration of co in coffee. In, but in your then, journey. But my first uh, shop is 23 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So, um, when you guys got to 20 years, what what happened at that point? Like, did you guys celebrate? Was there a... Well, uh, we had a big celebration. Mm -hmm. Every five years of a milestone mm -hmm. uh, would be a big celebration. So, 15 years, uh, we did have a celebration by offering uh, the market... Um, we just had a promotion for, for the market to enjoy our coffee. Um, 20 years was also a big celebration, but I think I'm looking forward to the 25th year, which is two years from now. Mm -hmm. I, 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 we haven't really planned it, but that should be a big one. So <clears throat> over 20 years, the market changes a lot. Mm -hmm. What are your key observations over the last 20 years? The 20 years of the market, well, the market now is, uh, has become more sophisticated. Right? Mm -hmm. So when we were, we, when we were starting up, uh, at the beginning, it was more of a struggle to introduce the whole, ex uh, espresso, um, uh, beverage to the market. It was totally new. What was prevalent at the time was just drip coffee or even instant coffee. And when we introduced espresso, it was like something repugnant. It was too strong for the market. <laughs> Even 1996, 96, that was, was pre-Starbucks here. Yes. Starbucks here is about 98, 99. 98, 99. Right? Yeah. So, yes, it was pre-Starbucks pre here in the Philippines. So, um, so we, we introduced the espresso beverages, cappuccino, latte, and... What we did was just add more milk, add more sugar until they got accepted by the market, right? But now, I think the market has become more discriminating in taste, right? They 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 would they would if you put more milk, they say no, I want it stronger in coffee. I want my coffee to be. There's a certain way that people like their coffee this uh, nowadays compared to how it was 20, 23 years ago. And do you find that those people are the same people, or are they new coffee drinkers? Um, no, there's definitely more coffee drinkers right now. I mean, people are starting drinking coffee at a younger age. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember back in the 80s and 90s, kids are not allowed to drink coffee because they stopped growing. That was the myth. Yeah. And so uh, people started drinking coffee right after college. Mm -hmm. um, for me, for example, I started drinking a lot of coffee when I was taking up law school. But I used that not because I enjoyed it, but I used it to to wake me up mm -hmm. because I had to study till the wee hours of the morning. It was a legal stimulant. It was, yeah. yeah. But now it's that uh, you know my kids, uh, even at grade uh, elementary or high school, asking me if they could drink coffee. But the good thing about uh, the difference before and now is also because there's a lot of innovation in in the coffee beverage industry. Mm -hmm. So. Before it was purely hot beverages. Mm -hmm. Now you can come up with all of these blended drinks, and mm -hmm. so that's for for the younger kids. It's their first intro to coffee is to the ice blended, very sweet drinks. Almost right? like a milkshake. Almost like a milkshake, yeah. a dessert, and then when they get older, they go now shift to the more serious stuff. Like yeah, well. There, I mean, you look at the landscape in Metro Manila, there aren't really go-to places for things like milkshakes, mm -hmm. right? You have fruit shakes, mm -hmm. and then you have coffee, and then that middle kind of um, non-coffee beverage that's like slushy, a milkshake, kids don't have an option, mm -hmm. right? So uh, coming to cafes with their parents, it actually becomes... Um, it becomes 
uh, more and more uh, important in the menu, mm -hmm. I think, right? Because I, you know, I have young children myself, mm -hmm. and I want to hang out in a the cafe. There needs to be something for them to have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you find yourselves in yardstick or cartel or something, they always give the kids these baby chinos. <laughs> um, which, which is the little um, chocolate and and steamed milk. Yeah. Um, so they like to play like they're drinking coffee. Yeah. Um, of course, my I imagine my children are much younger. I have a four year old and mm -hmm. um, and uh, the eldest is eight. It, it just turned eight. Um, but it's interesting because maybe a week ago we were in um, the new habitual cafe in Salcedo Village and uh, we had a my my wife had a cortado and. Uh, my eldest daughter, Summer, when she was finished with her coffee, took a teaspoon and started eating the coffee <laughs> yeah, out, out, you know, with the, with the teaspoon. Uh, I think because the, you know, the milk now, mm -hmm. the milk itself is sweet, uh -huh. right? And the coffee um, is also sweet, which is not something that we really had in the 90s. No, no definitely not. So now you you play around with the milk, you play around with the coffee. I mean, you know, there's there's just so many uh, advancement in 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 all of these new ingredients. So that that's good for the industry. How do you see? Because um, we we use these terms often, right? First wave, second wave, third wave, <coughs> and then there's specialty coffee. Mm -hmm. well, what's your definition of of those and of specialty coffee? Okay. So if you look at first, th second, third wave, uh, the first wave is really making mass producing coffee to be able to distribute to more people. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that was through manufacturing of instant coffee, mm -hmm. right? It's the fastest way to mass produce it, distribute it to as many people as they, they could at that time. And at the same time, you know, that's where all the Folgers and the Nescafe's and the Taster's Choice and all that stuff came came out at that time in 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 the 60s and 70s. And in the 80s, um, that's when the second wave followed next. And f for me, the second wave is really bringing in the espresso culture. How would you define third wave? And, and third wave uh, after after. Uh, uh, the cookie cutters uh, second wave where you have all these coffee shops uh, sprouting all over in the same fashion. I think uh, uh, the third wave came when uh, they elevated even that quality further, right? So, and, and people who started third wave experimenting more on on origins and experimenting more on processes on how to make uh, brewing processes, different brewing processes of coffee. That's for me is third wave, and when uh, and also it started uh, talking about traceability of coffee. Where does your coffee come from? The origins of the coffee. So there, the the focus of third wave was more on the beans itself, mm -hmm. and 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 that's for me is what third wave is all about. And the fourth wave, or well, I, I, there's no fourth wave term yet, but maybe you say specialty coffee. It's just uh, um, third wave taking up to the next level, where in the highest grade of coffee that you can ever find in in the industry would be called specialty. And this comes in micro lots; they come in small uh, batches. Uh, they're also uh, this. The, I think this specialty also now really more involves not just the beans itself, but now more in the 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 the, the, the the farmers and, 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 and the roasters themselves, right? So there's a lot of more intricacies going into, into specialty coffee. But I think the, the, the main, uh, for me is, uh, there's supply of the specialty coffee. It's not, it's not easily, you know, they, you can find it, you know where to find it, but it's not, Easily accessible in the quantities in the that, quantities that yeah. you'd want people to to try it on. And you have how many branches? Oh, we have, right now we have 102. So that's a lot of branches. It's a lot of coffee, and it's hard to source that amount. Especially Philippine specialty coffee. Yeah, what, it's how, hard. How do you think that can be solved? Well, that that's actually a big challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. Supply is a, is a is a concern that we have because there's not just not enough premium coffee that's in the market right now. 
So uh, uh, we source out most of our coffee from the highlands uh, in the north, in in the south. So we have Mindanao and we have in Benguet and Mountain Province. So if you go to our shops, you'll, you'll have a steady supply of coffee, Philippine coffee origins that comes from specific areas in the Philippines. And that's 100% Arabica. Um, for our uh, main beverage that we use uh, different kinds of blends, but this is uh, due to supply uh, concern. This is a now mix of Philippine coffee as well as those that we import um, from outside. But one of our most conscious effort that everything we do in most should have a blend of, of Philippine coffee. But if you want to try 100% Philippine coffee, it would be the Philippine coffee origins that we have. So right now we have five different origins. You have uh, Mount Matutum, Kitanglad, and Mount Apo from the Mindanao region. And you have Sagad and Benguet uh, up in the north. In Benguet, we have specific uh, areas, Ampukao, we have uh, Atok, and now we have Kaliking. So we're even going specific what town it comes from. How is the selection done for that? Do they come to you? Are you guys... Well, we, 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 we search for them, mm -hmm. but uh, right now, since we have, uh, uh, we have the name in the industry, people come to us yeah. and offer us uh, their, their supply and their harvest. And we, it goes through the process in our R&D where we taste all of these different kinds of coffee. And maybe out of 10, only two or three would pass. Okay. And, and that's what we would offer, offer to the market. And every year, uh, let, me, let me tell you, you might say that the coffee that you get this year will not taste the same as last year. No, definitely, because the supply is going to be a little bit different. It's also influenced by the weather. Uh, it's also yeah. influenced by uh, the rainfall for that particular year. And, and, then, and then, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of factors that influence the taste. But we try as much as possible to source that out from the same suppliers or the same farmers in origins. How many, how, like, um, as the number of stores grow, you're also growing your consumption of coffee, mm -hmm. right? Are you seeing there to be um, a potential inequity between the amount of coffee that you have available to purchase and the amount that you need to serve? That there will be. Uh, if we don't do our job in trying to uh, help communities in the farms uh, um, alleviate or or, or uh, expand production, then we will come to a point where we'll not be able to meet demand with supply. So right now we work with a with uh, the Philippine Coffee Council that's uh, very informally still formed. Yeah. We work with DTI mm -hmm. and DA and we also work with uh, private individuals and private uh organizations. Uh, in fact, um, I, I'd like to uh, tell you that we've recently just, uh, I can't divulge it, but we recently just got into a collaboration with a, a uh, very reputable group who are uh, uh, supporting farms up in the north. So uh, our way of helping is really to, to help uh, put up facilities for them, right? Mm -hmm. So and, and if, we, if we put these facilities, uh, my understanding is it will help increase supply. It'll make, uh, it'll make the life of farmers easier because then they don't have to travel so far to bring their cherries. The, the, the mills will be... We bring the mills to where their farms so are. you're talking about building a wet mill, building a dry mill yeah. in the locations where the farms are yeah. um, so that those... Uh, so that harvest can be processed. Ultimately. So right now it would just be a dry mill. Okay. Yeah. The initial uh, uh, collaboration we're working with is a dry mill. And that would be a matter of l we're essentially trying to limit the amount of coffee that gets wasted because it doesn't get processed. That's right. Right. Because that means that the coffee is there. That's right. It's just not being processed in a proper way that is worth uh, that you know is me meeting the spec for serving in your cafe. That's right. You know, there are two ways that you can help the farmer improve the farmer's lives. Big bottom line is increasing their income, right? Mm -hmm. 
But how do you increase income? Two ways, expand volume or process it right. So if you don't have the volume yet, then you teach them how to process it right. They get more value for whatever harvest they have. And if you help them with their, on, the, uh, on the planting side, right, then you expand their uh, production. At the same time, increase the quality of their coffee. So you bring that income of the farmers up and make, make lives better. Okay, so 102 stores, mm -hmm. and you have this new flagship store in Cebu. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that new store? The new store was a, a uh, something that I really wanted to do maybe three to four years back, mm -hmm. and it got material. It, it materialized last year. Uh, it's a store. It's a 300, 300, 350 square meter store, or a standalone store in Cebu. We call it Bo's Coffee Tribute Store. Mm -hmm. And why is it tribute? It's a tribute to Philippine coffee. It's also a tribute to to our roots where we started in Cebu. So it, when you step into that store, you'll have a full experience of an experience bar where you can have all different kinds of brewing methods you'd like to have your coffee. You can choose your origins from there and then you can choose how you want it brewed uh, with a very, uh, uh, we call it more of a, uh, a, a barista expert, mm -hmm. different from the barista who would handle the core bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have products there that are also just very exclusive to the experience bar. Yeah, that that's what's uh, that's what's the different in the particular store. There, are co we have coffee there that you can't find in all our other stores. So it's beyond. It's outside of the five ones that you said that you. Are yes, carrying? yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, but not, but I mean, you know, maybe one or two, right? But yeah. I think the big difference is the methods of brewing. Uh, we would have five different kinds of brewing methods, not only for coffee, but we also have uh, uh, select teas um, that you won't find in other bows. We, we would also have um, uh, methods that you won't find, brewing methods that are not available in our, all our other core stores. And uh, it's called an experience bar. At the same time, I'd like to call it a slow bar. Mm -hmm. well, it's a slow bar because you have time, take it slow. Yeah. And people and the barista can brew tell you the story about the coffee beans and, and where it comes from, tells you how it's being brewed, you know, deliberately and slow. And you know, in this very fast uh, fast paced life, I mean I think everyone should take time out and slow down a little bit. You know, we um whenever we train our baristas um, on, on our side in honeycombs, right? Mm -hmm. We train braces for clients. And of course, we train our own braces. And one of the things I always tell them is that, you know, when people come to the cafe, to the coffee shop, it's like going to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Like they are looking to escape from their lives mm -hmm. for 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from the way that they run Disneyland? Mm -hmm. Well, when someone comes out of, you know, comes out of the doors of the staff areas, and you're dressed as Mickey Mouse. You are, for all intents and purposes, Mickey Mouse. If you are dressed up as Buzz Lightyear, you are Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. And so it's the same thing for, for customers. When they come in and they see a barista, um, as much as they do see you as a human, they're expecting a certain performance, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's up to us to give them that escape, mm -hmm. right? To make them feel like this cup of coffee is, you know, a little cup of Disneyland, yeah. right, for them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, th that's one of the ways we approach it. And it, it's very interesting because you're talking about your, your cafe and you're describing it to me. And you guys have been do doing this for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, pre-third wave, mm -hmm. pre-specialty, it was a very different business. But what you're describing to me now sounds very much like a, like a you know, third wave specialty mm -hmm. coffee mm -hmm. cafe. Yeah. And as you described earlier, this, the different waves mm -hmm. and specialty coffee... Where do you see Bose fitting in in that uh, kind of in that spectrum? Yeah, no. So Bose, uh, it's it's second wave pushing it towards third wave, and for at a certain level, in some stores like the Tribute Store, we're offering what a specialty coffee is, right? So as I mentioned, there are coffee 
coffees in, in, in the tribute store that you can only find in tribute stores. Mm -hmm. And they're very limited in supply. It's you said stores. So are you planning to do more tribute stores? Maybe a couple more stores. Uh, I think tribute, it, giving tribute to Philippine coffee, it, it's really deserving for Philippine coffee. Right? So you, so, you think we're going to see one here in Manila? Well, it all depends on the location. If you okay, find the right yeah. place uh, for the right market, yes, we would. That's my that's our, our dream to be able to do in, in Metro Manila. So 100 stores, how do you maintain the quality, the consistency across so many locations? Do you guys have a process? Yes, we do. I mean, you know, you have the regular training, you have the, uh, the reg regular training. Uh, um, um, assimilate the baristas into the whole culture but you know the I think the key uh, element in trying to maintain quality is really inculcating the values of our companies and the culture of quality and innovation into our baristas so it's it starts from the time they step into Bose uh, first they at work it's nothing to do with coffee but all to do about culture and all to do about uh, what the vision and the mission is for both. Uh, that, how, how do you communicate that? Uh, we do through trainings. I mean, you okay. know, that's we, we, the things that they talk about initially as they join the company is really more about that. And then once they're aligned with that, then the coffee steps in, right? So they need to, they need to buy in to our mission and our vision and what we do. They need to buy into our values and the culture that we're trying to build, and the culture of quality and the culture of innovation. And getting these people is, is and finding these people to join us is actually not, not easy. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, not, not everyone can act totally understand that from that particular perspective. Um, but how do we do it? I think we, how do we get the right people? That's a question that is being yeah, asked. Yeah, the hiring right? process. We sell them the dream, right? It's like I always try to. If you ask people in our company who have been there for more than three to five years and ask them, why are you still here? Mm -hmm. And they'll give you an answer that they believe in what we do, that we have a mission that we need to accomplish. So in Bose, we hire people and we attract people, not because of who we are, but because of what we do, because they believe in what we do, right? So it's just a principle of why people buy your product. They buy the product, not just because of your product, but they buy your product because of what it stands for. So that's the same way that we try to, the same way that we attract and hire people. We hire people who believe in us, we hire people who uh, share the dream with us and share the vision with us and we, sh and, and we keep them by aligning our values together.